want to tell you a little bit of a story. You've heard me talk about Marion so many times. I can't tell you how important she was to my life. Uh, she was truly my first spiritual teacher. Even though she invited me to the Unity Church where she was secretary, uh, she taught me an awful lot. One of the, the little treasures she had, uh, some shelves in her living room, on it was this little wooden box. About that deep, this a plain wooden box. But one time she showed me what that plain wooden box. She called it polka prayer. Sounds intriguing already, right? Somewhere she got this, she didn't even remember. It had little pieces of paper with a, a paper band around them. So it was like, like little scrolls. And they were all standing straight up in the box, so you were looking down into the hole in the center of all those little scrolls. And it came with, well, it was an ice cream Spoon. Remember when they were made out of wood, the little flat things? And it was tapered to a, a, a sort of a point so that you could take the little stick, poke it down in there, and pull out one of those little scrolls. Carefully take the band off of it, the paper band, and read it. These were some of the promises from the Bible. I will tell you that there was hardly a time I went to Marion's house, I didn't poke a prayer. It was amazing how out of the blue, I'd sort of somehow be guided to the right promise, the right bit of truth, the right piece of information that I needed. The Bible's full of these promises. I don't know who it was who, who suggested at one time that uh, you could open the Bible at random, put your finger down, and read a verse. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Yeah, you've done that too, right? I will tell you, there were times where it was miraculous how it worked. But I think it's a common practice for a lot of people to read random passages in the Bible, and especially those things that we could call God's promises. You can buy a book of these things. Uh, in my uh, Bible software I have, it has, it has as one of the books in its collection, God's promises. And I didn't go to that book for, for what I'm talking about today, but it has a whole list of them, uh, and it's only a few of them. So I thought I'd, I'd help you find a few and give you some keys to open those promises, open them in your life for greater understanding. Now, just like each one of us, you have a spirit, a soul, and a body. So does the Bible. The body of the Bible, you've seen that many times, right? Mine, my Bible used to be, used to have a beautiful body black calf skin, supple, stamped in brilliant gold. You'd open it up and the pages were beautiful and pristine. And now it's pretty much a loosely, loose-leaf Bible, as you've seen before with pages falling out. But it's a good kind of loose-leaf it's the kind that comes from using it. That's its body. 
It has a soul, too. And that's all those words on the page. The history, the prophecies, the Gospels. The Revelation. The parables. All these things. And they're wonderful stories. But have you ever seen your spirit? Have you ever seen anybody else's spirit? It's invisible, is it not? And the, and the Bible has a spirit. And that spirit resides between the lines. That spirit is that hidden inner meaning. It's also found not only throughout the Bible, but in these promises as well. And those promises run from Genesis to Revelation. And those promises are what we could call higher law or principles. And they, the promises contain two things that are really important. They contain a condition something for us to fulfill or live up to and then there's the fruition or what happens when you do and that fruit of that uh, promise is exact I mean it's very clear the spirit of the Bible and the spirit in these promises or what heals, what dissolves challenges, what teaches us the things that we really need to learn to deal with this thing we call life. And it's not just an intellectual doctrine. It's not religious dogma. It's definite knowledge which we can practice. Charles Fillmore would call it practical. Practical truth practical Christianity as he referred to to Christianity it was a and, and unity as a practical form of Christianity what you can put to use in your life to make your life better now maybe not everybody knows but Charles Fillmore at one point talked about religion and he said if your religion doesn't make life better here and now what good is it The hidden Bible, the real spirit of the Bible, it does heal. The real spirit of the Bible does free you. It does help you change your mind and your heart. Reading the Bible only as history won't really do anything for you. Oh, you'll have some intellectual knowledge. How many times Jerusalem was sacked and how many sons somebody had, or how many wives, or how many... Sh what difference does it make till you get that meat that's in between the lines? So, you have the three promises on the back of your bulletin, and the first one is... <laughs> isn't it funny? Uh, my teacher, Michael Segru, said, uh, even pay attention to the verses, verse numbers. Jeremiah 33, 3. 3, 3, 3. That's a 9. Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you the great and hidden things which you have not known. This was not intended just for Jeremiah. Otherwise, why would it have been written down if it were just for Jeremiah? Wouldn't need to write it down. He'd remember that. Call to me. It is for all of us. And it's for all of us at all times. The first and important word is call. That's a key. If we were doing this in a class, I'd say underline call. Call. Well... 
if I didn't have a sense of separation, if I didn't have a sense of, uh, that God was not present, then I wouldn't need to call. In my thinking, in your thinking perhaps, when you have a sense of separation, where well, you're here and God's over in Sedalia, or maybe St. Louis, or heaven forbid, uh, Weston, Hackensack, yeah. When you feel like it's a long distance call, you need to call. You need to reach in, look inside. When you have a sense of separation, when you have God at a distance from you, when you do not have a sense of God's presence and you have difficulty because of it, that's what the call reminds us about. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever think that way? I'm sure you do. I think most of us do at one time or another. You know, maybe you have found that thing that God can't fix. Or you've got that that tropical illness that only God, even God can't cure. Ah, uh, maybe you're not worthy of God listening to you or responding to you. Call to me, and what happens? I will answer when you call. Gary Jones, uh, I've told you this before, when he said, when you feel separate from God, make no mistake, who moved? I always love that. So, if we have made the move, then it's for us to call. Hey, Dad, I'm lost. I need you. I need help bringing my thinking my feeling back to a sense of truth, to a sense of your presence right here with me now. You don't have to be better, just as you are. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and hidden or mighty things. Hidden or mighty things. No strings. Just call. Turn to God. Turn back to the source. Not call when circumstances are different or call when you're in a better mood or when you've behaved better or when you're more loving. No. Call. Then what? I will answer, but even more important. I will tell you great and hidden or mighty things. Not tell you about your faults, not tell you what's wrong with you, but wonderful things about you, the truth about you, and wonderful ways about working through whatever is your current problem. So I said there's a condition, call. And what's the truth? What's the, the fruit of of that call I tell you great and hidden things which you have not known that's illumination that's teaching that's answers that's what we want the next one on the back of your bulletin is from Psalm 145. It's the 18th verse. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who come to Paul, call upon him in truth. Near. Near is a key word. The Lord is where? Near. Here. Not at any distance. 
calls another keyword. Call upon him. It does not matter if you're good or not, saint or sinner, whether you go to church or not, whether you tithe or not. Recognize God is present right here, right now, and all you have to do is ask. Remember Jesus said that. Ask and you know the rest of it, right? You shall receive. Yeah, it does say ask and maybe God might sometime give you a little bit of something. Ask and you shall receive. And at one point he uses the word, word which I love very much. Of course, it's just the English translation. Whatsoever. Ask whatsoever ye will. There are times we don't ask. There are times when we feel a sense of separation. We, we need something in our lives. we don't not sure what it is, but we're lacking something. And we don't ask. Either for what we know we want or need, or for guidance to tell us what it is we need. The Lord is near, right here. And He's here to those who call. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him. Who do you call? Sure isn't Ghostbusters. Call upon the source. To all who call upon him in truth. Now there's another important word. That's another key word. In truth. Not just, how many times have you called out silently? Oh God, God. I, you want to list all mine? But see, these promises aren't about old time religion. This is, Science. Science. Something that's demonstrable, demonstrable, not quixotic. Old time religion, uh, it has promises. It holds promises after death. Mm, that's a safe place to put them, don't you think? <laughs> You'll ever have to worry about, oh, that didn't happen. This is scientific. It is repeatable. It is provable. The Lord is near to all who call upon him in truth. Just calling to God without any realization of his truth, that there is principle at work here, is not much. That's not an awful... That's not an awful lot. That's like so many people who have a Bible in their house. And there are plenty of people who have Bibles in their houses. It's one of the most, isn't it about the, the, the most purchased book in the world? I received a Bible when I became a member of the Presbyterian Church. I think I was 13. My grandmother gave it to me. I have it in the front room. She signed it and said, when Bill went into church, that meant being <laughs> made a member of the Presbyterian Church. Let me tell you about that Bible. It's still pristine. So basically from 13 until mm, it came here, <laughs> It was in the house, but it wasn't in me. My other Bible, the one that's fallen apart, I'm the reason it's falling apart. And that's a good thing, that it is falling apart. Because that means I've used it. And I've enjoyed it. When you think about God with, a, with new interest, with a new perce perception that God is ever-present, omnipresent, wherever, whenever you are, 
God is there. Whatever situation you're in, you're in. God is there. And you have a new belief and understanding that God is present in every situation in your life because you understand this hidden Bible that's in these, in these promises that God is near when you call. Near when you turn to Him and you turn to Him in truth, meaning you see God as God is, present, not absence. Then things begin to happen. Changes come about. This particular one. So what's the condition you have to fulfill? To call upon God, yes. To all who call upon Him in truth. The third one, Psalm 34, 10. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Do you ever think of yourself as a young lion? What's a young lion? It's a cub, isn't it? Yeah. It's an infant. Or it's, it's, it's not full grown. Isn't that what we are? When we are in a consciousness of only human? If it's to be, I have to make it happen. It's who I know. I'm using all of the stuff of human consciousness to try and get along in this world. That is a position of spiritual immaturity. That's a young lion. What's a lion? King of the jungle. King of the jungle. It reminds me of when... Uh, Martha, Martha Judici commented about someone who suggested the class bow their heads in prayer as her head popped up when she heard those words and she said, uh, we don't bow. You are a king's kid. King of the jungle. King of this world. That's what you're created to be. Christ in you is Lord. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So, you've got some interesting words. Lord, seek, and good thing such as lack no good thing. What's the result of fulfillment of the condition? Seeking the Lord of your being? Lack no good thing. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? All you got to do is seek the Lord. It's a statement of higher law, of principle. And also, each of these contains, remember, a condition to meet and once that's met, a fruit or result to be gained. The fruit of this promise, lack no good thing. How'd you like that in your life? Lack no good thing. Love enough, health enough, peace enough, joy enough, substance enough. Pretty enough. Clear and exact. You can't twist that. That's as clear as can be. Now, those who seek the Lord, the hidden law, God's exact way to the fulfillment made manifest, that is what the Lord must mean to you. The way to fulfillment. Yeah, Lord is, is your Father God, sure. 
The Lord is on almost every page in the Bible. Jesus wasn't called Lord until he had personified that name, that he had, when he had demonstrated it. So when any of us, those of us who, who seek the Lord and truly seek the higher law, the principle, what is God's plan, and see it being done in our lives, then we want for no good thing. That's pretty nice, isn't it? How can you seek the Lord? It's been suggested that you do. Where are you going to look? Yeah. And that means, sorry folks, I have to say the M word. Meditation. Contemplation. Looking within yourself. Reminding yourself. So affirming God is present. God is here with you right now at all points in time and space. That you are God's beloved child in whom God is well pleased. And you open your mind and your heart to all those good things. And that's not just things. Isn't it? A peaceful mind, a good thing. A healthy body is a good thing. A sense of being loved is a good thing. Joy in each day is a good thing. I'd like to give you a, a, an assignment. I'm going to do probably three more next week. But I'd like you to whip out your Bible sometime this week and hunt through, see if you can find some, some promises, and see if you can find the condition to be met and what is the fruit or the result of meeting it. Both should be clear. And these are just pretty much, you see how long these are, pretty much one-liners. Give it a shot. You may surprise yourself.